Okay, our presentation for today is on lateralization and behavioral genetics. And this is a module that corresponds with chapter two. In other words, it's a specialized piece of the chapter on biology. Your goals for this module should um, include the following concepts. You should understand lateralization, in other words, the right and left hemisphere differences in the brain. You should understand the role of the corpus callosum and communication between the hemispheres, and also understand the relevance of split brain patients in helping us understand lateralization. You should also understand these concepts related to behavioral genetics. First of all, just a definition of behavioral genetics. Second, a definition of identical and fraternal twins. And how Bouchard, a researcher's controversial uh, study on identical twins, helped us understand the role of genetics and behavior. Finally, um, you should have an appreciation of gene and environment interactions in determining behavior. Okay, in terms of lateralization, the definition of lateralization um, is that lateralization is really specialization of the right and the left hemisphere. The role of the corpus callosum we'll discuss a little bit and how that helps the hemispheres communicate. And we'll talk about split brain patients. So to begin the um, piece on lateralization, if you looked at the brain from uh, a top view, as if you had a camera suspended from the ceiling and you were looking down at the top of the brain, you could, if you slightly separated the two hemispheres or halves of the brain, see a structure called the corpus callosum, which is a um, network of fibers that connects the two hemispheres. And there is a right hemisphere and a left hemisphere. They're somewhat lateralized, which means that there are certain functions that are specific to the right and the left hemisphere. So again, this hemispheric specialization is lateralization. The right hemisphere is specialized for spatial tasks, for instance, being able to visualize objects. Uh, an example of this is when a sculptor does his or her job and sculpts a statue. They have to be able to visualize the product as their, um, the end product as they're going through the process. Another example of spatial vis visualization is if you could, um, from wherever you're seated right now, kind of visualize where you're located in the building, the side of the building and um, which pieces of the building that you're in that face in which direction, east, west, north, south. Um, the left hemisphere is specialized for language, and this is a very strongly lateralized trait. In other words, um, we see left hemisphere specialization for language in almost all people, and it includes speaking and reading. Lateralization also exists in terms of physical control. So your left hemisphere controls the right half of the body. The right hemisphere controls the left half of the body. So how do these two uh, lateralized hemispheres communicate? Well, this thick fibrous band that I mentioned earlier helps the two hemispheres communicate or pass information from the left and the right and the right and the left hemispheres. It's a huge network of fibers. And, you know, you may ask, well, how do we know that this is the way that these hemispheres communicate? We know it in part from early work on what's called split brain patients. And these are people with a severed corpus callosum. So split brain patients help us understand lateralization. Um, just as an aside, uh, you might ask, when would anyone ever split or sever the corpus callosum or this connection between the hemispheres? Typically, you only do it when um, all other approaches have failed in order to control epilepsy. You can think of epilepsy as kind of an electrical firestorm and unfortunately, for a very small percentage of the population, anti-epileptic drugs don't work. And to control the severity of the um, seizures, you may sever the corpus callosum. 
functioning after severing is very normal, so you wouldn't see any kind of behavioral abnormalities at all or any kind of abnormalities outside of a very controlled lab setting. There's a case study that you may want to click on this link below, or you can just copy and paste this link, and the link is called Split Brain Patient Joe Being Tested with Stimuli Presented in Different Visual Fields. You can find this on YouTube. Let's move to the second topic of behavioral genetics, and we'll cover the definition and how twin studies have helped us understand behavioral genetics. We'll also talk about gene-environment interactions. To begin, behavioral genetics involves a study of how heredity interacts with our experience to determine personality and other behaviors. So let's take a look at some of the definitions of identical and fraternal twins and how this helps us understand these questions about the relative contribution of genetics and environment. Identical twins, of course, share the same genes. Fraternal twins share the same fetal environment, but they're no more genetically similar than other non-twins. Bouchard was a researcher who did a very controversial identical twin study, and what he found was that even for identical twins who were raised separately, they had unusually similar tastes, physical attributes, personality, attitudes, abilities, and so on, much more similar than you would expect for two people who were just selected from the general population. Some of the research that's out there suggests that genetic influences explain 40 to 50 percent of the variability in personality traits. So it suggests that parenting is still important, but may be less important than we previously believed. There's a video of Bouchard's work that you may enjoy, and you can start this around 2 minutes and 47 seconds or 3 minutes to just focus on Bouchard if you wish. And the name of it is... Behavioral Genetics, Thomas Bouchard, Jr., University of Minnesota. And you can find this on YouTube. Finally, let's look at gene-environment interactions. Bouchard's work is pretty controversial, and one reason it's controversial is we know that some of his twins, even though they were reared apart, they were kind of introduced to one another before the data of the study was gathered, so that may have contaminated some of the data. Not all of it, but some of it. Most psychologists do believe uh, genes are important, but that environment is also very important too, and so that both interact, genes and environment, in determining behavior. And this is just called the gene-environment interaction. Okay, as you finish this module, you want to make sure that you've reached the goals that we talked about in the beginning. You want to understand lateralization, the role of the corpus callosum in communication between hemispheres, the role of split brain patients in helping us understand lateralization. In terms of behavioral genetics, you want to understand the definition of behavioral genetics, the definition of identical and fraternal twins, Bouchard's research and how it helped us understand the importance of genetic influences on behavior and the meaning of gene-environment interactions. Once again, I hope you enjoyed this audio presentation of information on behavioral genetics and lateralization.